Uh, they are both uh, really fantastic, and we really appreciate them taking the time tonight to be with us. So, first up, uh, I will introduce uh, uh, Vin White. He uh, is a, a senior, or uh, he is a policy advisor for the Secretary of Transportation. Uh, he has been uh, working on the Secretary Fox's 30-year plan called Beyond Traffic, which sounds like an awesome movie. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, be, and in addition to that, he worked for uh, a, on the project to provide Department of Transportation relief following Hurricane Sandy. So, ladies and gentlemen, can we do a big round of applause for Mr. Ben Woo! <laughs> I just reiterated how to pronounce his last name, Dingus, is a senior manager at, at the director, a uh, senior managing director at the American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, before that, I love this, he worked at the National Audubon Society. So if anyone has a bird question, uh, we should work that in. So ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause, Casey Dingus! <laughs> so much for being here. Yes, just um, be careful. We are very poorly insured. Um, <laughs> don't know anything about this stage. So, so uh, thank you both so much for uh, being here and uh, uh, taking time with us. Uh, there is, I think I said to both of you at uh, different times before we started the show, there's so much that we could talk about. Um, and so I guess a way, and I think that this is something both of you have talked about and written about, is just sort of to try and set the table as far as where we are now, like nationally, uh, in terms of either infrastructure or transportation uh, infrastructure specifically. Sort of, I know that uh, ASE does a report card about some of these things. I know that uh, you've been doing talks about this. So maybe we'll just, I mean, uh, I'm in graduate school uh, from the University of Minnesota, so I like report cards, so we'll just start with that. What, what what do we get? Um, well, the, uh, the the nation's overall infrastructure grade is a D plus. Now that's up from a D in 2009. So the line is starting to move in the right direction. Um, that's a tiny triumph, to quote the Stephen Colbert when he got a hold of the report card. Um, but we still have a long way to go in the transportation space. The transit's a D. Roads are a D. Bridges, there's a lot of focus on bridges. Some people get a little nervous uh, going over bridges. Those are actually up to a C plus. Um, there's been a lot of funding at the state level. There was, um, you know, stimu stimulus was uh, a bad word for some people in this town, but actually some of that money actually got out to the states and helped in a number of infrastructure sectors, not just bridges, but, but water systems too. So um, the grades are not good. Um, they're starting to trend a little bit in the right direction. And when we look at some of the states, you know, this isn't just a federal thing, right? Sure. There's local mm -hmm. government, state government. The states and red states and blue states in the last two years have been starting to step up and taking some tough votes, have been raising some resources to devote to this issue. So at least on bridges, things are looking a little better. And I want to ask more about how, it, but can you just give us a sense of when you say it's a D or a C or what is that based on? Is that based on the number of dollars that's going into it? The uh, you actually go out there and you chip away at a little bit of a bridge and you're like, ooh, that one's pretty crumbly, that's a C minus. Um, we shouldn't have paper mache here for this, so. Um. We look at a lot of, uh, there are seven criteria. We, when we did the report card, there are 16 categories now that we look at, so let's just focus on roads since that's sure. kind of point of focus here. Seven criteria that we use, funding is one of them, maintenance is one, um, sustainability, sustainability and resilience are, are new factors we're looking at. Capacity. Uh, you could have a road that's actually, the pavement's in good condition, but it is simply overwhelmed by the demands that are being put on that road every day. So, uh, in some cases, transit or other policies might be helpful in a community. You know, we're, even civil engineers now, we love designing and building stuff, especially big stuff. Um, we can't really design and build our way out of this. It's going to be a mix of, of new structures, better management of existing facilities, and then policy changes that we can make. Uh, in this region, there's a lot of telecommuting that goes on in the work environment. Flexible work schedules can help, and there's also been a number of innovative infrastructure projects. People have heard of things like the hot lanes uh, projects that are that are going on. Of course, we've all heard of that, but Lexus it's not. Sometimes, <laughs> called, sometimes called 
Lexus lanes because maybe you have to own a Lexus to pay ten dollars to go ten miles to get to Tyson's. Is this like uh, you have a tag on your car or something that? You have a transponder. transponder. So these are um, these are uh, toll facilities that don't require people to operate the, the toll facility. Uh, so, uh, uh, Mr. White, I wanted to ask, uh, how do, so it, it's sort of a similar question of uh, how did we get here, I guess. Uh, is it, uh, you know, it, it's never, everyone points to sort of creating the highway system under Eisenhower and then they're like, and then, uh, and then maybe we just didn't do anything until yesterday and we're like, oh God, we forgot to like take care of infrastructure for the last 60 years. We should do something. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, one thing I'll say about infrastructure is it's not it's not movable. So you kind of you can't put in the uh, Eisenhower uh, a highway system and then just kind of shift it around to uh, you know to accommodate uh, capacity, space, um, uh, land use, migration. Uh, one thing that we've looked at is more of this forecast. This you know that's where we've been. This is where we are now. And then what does the next three decades hold for us? Uh, it's not. Uh, if you if you look at the trajectory, we might have raised our grade a little bit, but it's, it's not a pretty picture. Uh, we're going through a series of congressional actions that will get us to the next cliff that will help us patch until we get to the next cliff. Uh, cliff is a very scary word in terms like of bridges. Use, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, a bridge without a cliff. A bridge without a cliff. Okay, uh, so uh, you mentioned several things in there, and uh, so sort of similar question about uh, how you do the grading, how do you do the projections then? Well, the projections are actually based off of a series of uh, what we like to think of as unassailable data and research experts uh, weighing into what paints this patchwork picture of the future. Uh, so what does that picture look like? Uh, well, in 30 years, we're gonna have 70 million more Americans. Uh, what do you do with Americans uh, when you added 70 million more? That's like adding New York, Texas, and Florida. And what I tell people is it's not Manhattan, Houston, and Miami. It's the entire states. Uh, what does that mean for migratory patterns? 75% uh, of people live in 11 distinct mega regions across the country. Um, so as we're shifting and moving, what does that mean for how we use the land around us? How do we gain capacity from that? Uh, I wanted to, so I guess what I don't know, you just asked a really good question. I was trying to think of a way to improve it, and I can't. So, uh, how do we do that? Uh, <laughs> well, um, and so one of the uh, areas that I think holds promise is obviously innovation. Um, so, how do we gain efficiencies uh, through technology, better uses of data? Uh, how do we gain, uh, how do we increase safety? How do we cut down emissions? We can do that through technology. Uh, there's vehicle to vehicle technology where people talk about cars that communicate with other cars. Uh, it's really just an exchange of data to create and efficiency. Just on this point alone, yeah. how many times have people been at a light waiting to make, make a left hand turn and there's 10 cars in front of yeah. you? The arrow turns green, and you're the tenth car, and you're wondering if you're actually going to make it through that life that, that life cycle. Okay, yeah. so if the cars are actually communicating with each other, they can all start moving at almost the same time, and then you will get through the intersection. Have you all seen any movies about the future? <laughs> <laughs> it seems like the moment that computers talk to each other is like the end of the world. <laughs> there. This, Listen, if it, if it can, can it, if it make it easier to get around this region in rush hour, I think we would. Play. We would all be okay with the Mad Max future that you're bringing. So, um, <laughs> I just, I, there's plenty of gas. Uh, so, uh, uh, no, so I want to, so uh, we've got a couple here, and I want to give you, so technology, innovation, what, I mean, what, uh, you're, you're a civil engineer. Uh, well, I'm not, I actually work for them. Uh, sometimes I play one on TV. Okay. Uh, uh, but no, the technology, there's a lot, and it, you know, all the technology we see in the world is finding, you know, computers and GPS and all this stuff is finding its way into the industry. Although it does look like we kind of build roads the same way we did, you know, 50 years ago. And in some ways they've changed, but, you know, incrementally there haven't been, you know, huge game changers. Although now there's pavements that are being developed that are more porous, so water can go through instead of, you know, running off and, you know, creating, you know, bigger stormwater problems for us. There's now these robots that are being developed to, um, you know, walk around on bridges and inspect no. bridges. <laughs> Bridge box. In fact, we maybe they'll even name one of them T two P two. I mean, they're looking for names for these robots. So, you know, so <laughs> okay. Bridge 
bots. The bridge bots. Bridge bots. Bridge bots. And so they just they go and they do the picking away at the bridge. To Actually, see and they can use non-destructive technologies to you know monitor the condition of the bridge. And and now when they build new bridges, the Minneapolis bridge, um, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with, when that was rebuilt. Um, they embedded the bridge with uh, monitoring technology. So I like all of this. This is all, I, I appreciate uh, the, uh, talking about different ways to sort of preserve the, uh, the uh, infrastructure that we have and making it uh, last longer through these different technologies. However, I mean, we're in DC and it's the historic thing is for a, a congressperson to be able to go home and say, look it, I built you this new bridge or I added a lane to this highway or whatever. Uh, and so I've got. I mean, I, I guess I'm asking, how much is that part of these equations as well? When you talk about what more do we need, is it that we need simply to invest that amount of money in, in fixing and maintaining stuff, or is it that we need to build new stuff in, in addition? Well, well, well I, I think that. Um, I think you got to do both. Right, you have to do both, but I think that we are dealing with uh, quite a backlog of uh, infrastructure that needs to be addressed. Um, Bridges that are falling, bridges that are obsolete or structurally deficient. 60,000 structurally deficient bridges in the yeah. United States. One out of every four. Jeez. And, that's oh. that's, and another 60,000 are functionally obsolete. What is that? Functionally obsolete. <laughs> that means you wouldn't design a bridge like that in this day and age. Uh, in other words, it could be a bridge that has lanes that are too narrow, may lack shoulders. That, it's not that, just a bridge that like goes to New Jersey, so no one wants to go. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting. I do hear more about the bridge when I talk about this stuff. I, you know, the bridge to nowhere comes up more often yeah. than the Minneapolis bridge collapse. That's weird. That's interesting. Yeah. People got burned. People got really worked up about the whole idea of bridges to nowhere. I mean, I, I again, like, so we do both. Uh, I, I do kind of want to press this though, and maybe it's because you both are uh, very smart policy folks. Because, uh, well, let me ask this of Vin. So, uh, my understanding, the way a lot of the Department of Transportation works, is as we've even heard, you uh, there's a lot of money that goes to the states to do things. So, I guess the question is, how much can if you say, you know, you guys, you really need to spend this money on uh, maintaining and fixing things, and then the states like, sure we will, and then they build a monorail or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, for too many monorails uh, recently, uh, but. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, there, there's funding in the form of uh, formula funding, which is just that. Uh, you go through a formula process and it uh, spits out a number as to which states get what allocation. Um, and that's very rigid, those dollars. Uh, there are discretionary dollars that are a very small percentage of where we get to actually say how you can use this, where you can apply it. We can establish criteria. Uh, one of the great hopes, I think, for the future uh, is the establishment of performance measures where we're actually able to say, like, you've reached this threshold, so you are awarded or rewarded for that, um, for making those marks. Um, but that's still kind of a new phenomenon. We're still very so much like stuck. It's like a no road left well, behind kind of. of. There was a good <laughs> answer in the past where if the state was truly irresponsible and let something completely fall apart, well, you know, the feds will pay 80% of the, the, the price of a new, you know, interstate highway system. So, you know, just don't maintain it at all, and then you might actually get more money out of Washington. So I think we've moved beyond that, and you know, the, the states have to be you know, more responsible. We don't and want to reward right. uh, bad behavior. And the states are stepping up, as you alluded to it before. Yeah, um, they're coming up with their own scheming systems. They're coming up with uh, you know various ways to match dollars to leverage and get those investments out. They're, they're actually raising their gas taxes in some cases, indexing them to inflation. And yet, the mere mention of the word gas tax in a town like this, and people are running for the tall grass as fast as you can imagine. And we haven't raised it since 1993. It was never adjusted for inflation. It's now a dollar cheaper a gallon today than it was a year ago. So if there ever was a time where you could have a sober debate in this town about using the gas tax, it's now, and it's not perfect because yes. a lot of cars now and in the future can be powered by something other than gasoline. Yeah. So we got to get, I think in the future it'll be a vehicle miles traveled approach. In other words, how many miles does your car actually drive? What? So what why, fair is way now now then? why not just immediately go to that then? Well, we got a pilot program in Oregon, you know how, you know how it goes. You got to pilot this stuff somewhere. You kind of got to, you know, noodle all the issues. Yeah. And Oregon's had a pretty good um, experiment with this. And 
you know, people get, as soon as you talk about te you know, technology and Big Brother knowing how many miles you drove in a year, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I got the ACLU involved. <laughs> <laughs> Again, as I promised, we're going to open it up to you all for questions in the second half. But before uh, we let you all go, so uh, we talked to, uh, obviously, I think innovation, technology, or things. I guess what are the other, just to sort of round out this part of the conversation, big changes uh, that are currently happening or are projecting to happen in the next 30 years or so? Oh, well, um, there's this thing, it's called climate change. Uh, how we're adapting, how we're making our systems more resilient. Does that mean all the bridges just need to be higher if they're in close proximity? Or fastened better if they're not high enough? Oh, oh God, I treated that, that as a serious question. Just <laughs> <laughs> they just floated off the foundations in Katrina. Oh. So. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so, so in the future, though, to give you an example here, um, you know, we talked about population earlier, uh, talking about climate change, talking about Katrina, bringing that up, is um, you, you, how one affects the other, where they intersect. Uh, Katrina uh, hit, that was the largest mass migration in U.S. since the Dust Bowl. Uh, the population of Baton Rouge tripled overnight. Um, so how do these two trends meet, and then how do we adapt to facilitate for that there? The other things that we have to think about are just how do we align our decisions in dollars? These have to be practical decisions that are being made. Um, and then just how do we get our stuff? If it's 390 million people in 30 years, how is freight going to flow? Uh, and what are the impl implications for innovations in that space when drones are delivering your Amazon and when you can 3D print what you want in the basement? How does that affect you getting what you want? So resilience, I think, gets at the climate change issue, the, especially in coastal environments. Any infrastructure, transportation, or whatever, will have to be resilient. And you're planning out for 100 years in, a, in, a, in an environment that's kind of very uncertain and hard to predict. Um, uh, the other thing about infrastructure is the sustainability issue. And when we at ASC talk about sustainability, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a three-pronged approach. It has to be a project or a system of projects have to be economically viable, environmentally acceptable, and socially supportive. So you really need all three pieces of that to, to have a um, um, what we call sustainable infrastructure. And can, can you say just a little bit about that last piece? How do you figure the social? If you think, the how social do you decide part? whether something is social? Well, you know, think about it. Um, look what happened in Boston, where um, you know, we built the interstate highway system back in the day, and then you know, you get 25 years go by, and people say we've got this elevated structure that's cutting the community in half. Why don't we just you know put it underground? So there were people suggesting that back in the day they weren't a loud voice or necessarily a, a compelling voice necessarily, but they certainly had a point of view. And as we look back in time now, we're, we're thinking even out here in Tyson's Corner, the idea of metro going above ground or underground was a huge issue. So uh, whenever we're making these infrastructure decisions, taking the longer view. Um, taking into account the values of, of society, but you would never in this day and age have an elevated highway structure going through a community where you're literally separating the community in half. And a lot of these communities are trying to uh, come back to integration with the center city. All right, uh, on that uh, uh, note that's great for comedy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> these guys are so great, uh, fantastic. Can we do a big round of applause? <laughs> to answer all of your questions, but uh, before we do that, we're going to turn the stage over to the cast of uh, the Theater of Public Policy. Uh, as promised, everything that they do is entirely made up and inspired by what we just talked about. This is all improvised. So be generous and uh, make a big round of applause for the cast. Oh my god, Eloise, I knew this was gonna happen. <laughs> we have to discuss our relationship, and I decided to choose a metaphor. A bridge. <gasps> our love bridge. I give our love bridge a B minus. <laughs> there are seven criteria for the love bridge. <laughs> you and said you it was long enough.
You mind if I stand behind you as you drive? <laughs> Really I'm taking you. over soon. I'm the new Hewlett Packard computer car. So I'm in a monitoring stage of how you humans drive. Because soon this is my rodeo. So. I really wish I could. Oh, I'll just change the audio. I'd like a female voice, please. Oh, hey Sam. <laughs> you drive you drive this road often? Yes, it's this road. <laughs> You're fun. <laughs> You, you, you should you should go less than seventy though. Your 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 gas mileage is gonna be efficient. It's gonna go way up. <laughs> so, uh, uh, am I supposed to make the the right turn up here? Uh, let's let let's let you make the decision. <laughs> My car communicated with your car. My name is, is Dale, and it, uh, it brought me here. So, so then, I, yeah, I don't live anywhere near here, but I, here I am at your house. You don't live here either, so we're at somebody else's house. That's weird. I wonder if they're home. Let's see. Um. Susan, I thought your car only spoke to my car. Who's this? Who's this? We, we were just brought here together. Yeah. Oh, I see. He drives a sedan. You were looking for a four-door model. I understand. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I drive a Tesla. So, uh... Oh, he's rich and environmentally friendly. <laughs> you know what I wanted to get into the hat lanes? <laughs> he's hot. <laughs> this... This is not good. There's nothing good about this. I, uh, have a suggestion. Oh, I put it in the suggestion box. <laughs> All right, I guess this is another metaphor. Um, we could get a mobile home. <laughs> and then we could drive everywhere together. Think of the mileage. <laughs> All three of us? Yeah, think of the tiny shower that only has water pressure some of the time. Come to that shower. <laughs> uh, I just needed the loofah. Uh, <laughs> The shampoo is out by the kitchen, sorry. <laughs> Bye! <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Honey, I know that these clothes don't fit you anymore, but we, we bought them when you had less volume. <laughs> so we can't... Just say it. Just say it, I'm not getting any handsomer. Your honey, it's it's that you also just grew. We bought this for a five-year-old, and now you're like, you know, 30. So it's that you've grown, and we can't... Just we can't just buy you new clothes. It's kind of like they're here and they're obvious. <laughs> You're not helping the problem. You're not encouraging me. Thank I could go out and do things myself, but... Like what? Buy new clothes? You, you want to try and navigate the sales rack of Kohl's? Because it's a jungle. <laughs> it, is a, it is a sad jungle. <laughs> and you will not return alive. Excuse me, I, I work for the ACLU and I've been listening in just to see how it works. God um, damn it. I, 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 I brought a, a bigger shirt for him. I'm from the, you know, I'm not part of the federal government, but I... I just thought that this might might be a way to help. What a waste of taxpayer dollar! <laughs> just to buy you something that fits more accurately to your needs it. now? <laughs> Let it affect your feelings. <laughs> it fits! You don't happen to have a pair of pants, do you? Oh, well, do I? <laughs> <laughs> pants within pants! I'll leave it to you two. What can't the government do? <laughs> It's weird to have them cover more than... <laughs> I am so sick of telecommuting. The kitchen is so far from my desk. <laughs> and the chair is in the way. <laughs> I say we just let the computers talk to each other and finish the work. Fine. I wish they'd get me a sandwich. We Why? could call the robot. Oh, all right. But like we know what happened the last time. Cut to last time. <laughs> you said you two would never be alone in the same room. <laughs> I only do as I'm ordered. I'm sorry. Allison! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Put it back. <laughs> I like art. <laughs> I think it works. I think that it's good. But it's not functional to my needs right now. Maybe, maybe before it would have been nice to have, you know, the fellow curator not be facing me. But this is a small office. 
And if I don't feel like I can make eye contact with you, then what's the point of this? You're not using the chair as it was intended. This is a repurposing that I cannot be on board with. But statistics say that compromise has greater yield. Continue! <laughs> I'm looking into your eyes through the back of your head. <laughs> Even though the chair was not originally facing that way, repurposing it so that you can look through my head into my eyes. This is a very flexible proposition. We do not have to pay for a new chair, even. and we're a museum, so we don't get like any money because no one comes to us anymore. The ACLU would be so happy. They would. Even solving our own problems. My God, and you know how arts people can't do that. It's a good stool. <laughs> <laughs> Chief! <laughs> I'm in the U.S. House of Representatives. I can't have my name on a rehabilitation project. I need a project named after me. Come on, start picking! What are the bridges that we built? How about the bridge to anywhere? I think that would be Broad base, uh, I like that. Murphy's no. Basin! A bridge to anywhere is stupid. It has to go somewhere. It has to remind people of yesteryear. Do you think people took an Eisenhower road to anywhere? No! I they think they did. I think they took many of them, actually. <laughs> <laughs> they took them to fallout shelter. I'm just an intern. I don't get paid. <laughs> I'm trying to learn from you, sir. We're future civil engineers. I'm sorry. I got the better of me. I was upset. I did work out one of those traffic circles, and we're gonna name like the, the southwest part of it after you. Yeah. Uh, southwest part, huh? Yeah, yeah. So when people go over, there's a little plaque that you can't read if you're going at any speed higher. Than <laughs> than <laughs> than <laughs> than <laughs> say the Brandon boat turnaround. How about we upgrade that to a statue? Can we do that? Can I get a statue in my parklet? Yes. Uh, yes. 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 Yeah. The intern has funding decision. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stand up straight, you don't want to be called a troll anymore. Seven day notice till this bridge is demolished. Girl, okay. You and your billy goat, you go to hell. <laughs> straight to hell. I'm sorry, I was walking away back to my car. Did you say something to me, little weird boy? I did, and I put a hex on all of your unborn children. Oh, oh I'm boy. sure that's a real thing. <laughs> this has escalated quickly into the hex category. We didn't need to do this. They're gonna blow up the bridge. She's been pumping that TNT thing like a cartoon for over 25 minutes. You can only afford the seven day activated TNT, so she has to do it for seven days. Listen, I know that you're trying to do your job, but there are people or creatures that live here in this bridge. And We're humanoid. He oh. <laughs> so that's happening. And it feels like the proper thing to do would be to just. Maybe find a way to repair it instead of take it all down. Unfortunately, we're in a post-humanoid society and it's functionally obsolescent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Could you just, why don't you just, just, just dig me a culvert or something? I live under bridges! Oh, we don't use culvert anymore either. We use open pits for sewers and water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that seems like the opposite of what is Yeah, we're the opposite of the Rome. It's good enough for us, right? Oh, so, yeah. Yes. 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 That often leads to terrible events. That <laughs> you think because I'm a troll I don't vote? I'm gonna vote this time. Do you vote? Or no, but I will! <laughs> I don't think he will. I doubt it. <laughs> Honey? Yes? Um, I, I think there's something that we should talk about. Specifically, um, you know the HOV lane that goes by our house. I do. Is a plus two. There's only two of us. I was thinking that we could maybe expand our love a little and add another person to the marriage. <laughs> so that we can use the lane. He's up. I told him to come a little later. It's early. <laughs> yeah, I saw the Craigslist ad for an HOV partner. <laughs> Can you, um... Can you need a or anything? They're so, on filter. Tobias, I love you so much, but it feels like you're always looking for excuses to list three ways on Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> we got a deal. 
minus. Oh. A minus. I'm sorry, Bridge. Come here. <laughs> what am I going to do? You're going to crumble. <laughs> You're going to bring them down. Rush hour. They Cut. trust me. Cut to the bridge at an open mic where she talks about what it feels like to get a D minus and the emotional <laughs> crumbling that happens with that. <laughs> let it out, sister. Let it out. I got a D minus. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Take me nowhere. It sinks down to the depths of my toes. Oh, yeah. Where it goes, nobody knows. <laughs> the water is seeping up, up to my ankles. It's covering up my cankles. So oh. you become a fairy. So many people, they don't even know it. Didn't know we could smoke it. <laughs> Their lives are gonna be rerouted north, south, east. Do they go over or under? <laughs> Your guess is best. <sighs> Sometimes it rhymes. <laughs> downgrading myself. <laughs> I turn from you, but slowly, because I'm parked in a tiny space. <laughs> Fine, have it your way. But next time a bus looks at you, remember how it felt. <laughs> <laughs> I see you in my rearview mirror. <laughs> we have both turned away. <laughs> making it difficult for us to communicate. <laughs> My data signals are no longer pointed in your direction. And yet I feel a lingering desire to receive data signals. <laughs> what is love, Lord Fiesta? Love is something that will make you late for everything and unhappy. It will take your gas tank and make it empty. And you will live on fumes and hope. <laughs> but someday, perhaps, and that was when I decided to make a Broadway musical called Fumes and Hope. <laughs>
in New Jersey, I saw something that brought me to my knees. It was a Prius. She was half and half, and I wanted to hybrid with her. to her side door I prayed there'd be something that you would like to ask of our guests, and you will have a chance to uh, rehearse and make a new friend. All right, so ready, set, go. What? selected the flyways they want to use. I remember doing an undergraduate thesis, uh, I didn't go to college in North Dakota, but the focus of my thesis was in North Dakota. Because this, you needed an this excuse to go. <laughs> <laughs> this is the structure. Right, right. I mean, it's, it's, I mean college and Canadian, what am I doing in North Dakota? Anyways, um, there, the government was trying to build this big water project out there, a big infrastructure project, um, and it was so damaging and ill-conceived, it was going to destroy 13 national wildlife refuge areas just in the state of North Dakota, but it was also going to disrupt what was called the Central Migratory Flyway. So, you know, these flyways have been established by, you know, migratory waterfowl over the, you know, I guess the eons. I mean, there's some on the, in the western part of the United States. There's this big one in the central part of the U.S. So I think they've kind of established, you know, what they need and you know where they're going to fly. So I think it's really incumbent upon us to try to work around that once we have that. And does that then end up being part of the the grades or the the suggestions or policy prescriptions that you all put out as ASCE? Well, again, remember these projects have to be economically viable and environmentally sustainable and socially supportive. So. 
you know, infrastructure is, is looked through a lens differently now than it was when a project like the Garrison Diversion in North Dakota was conceived. The good old Garrison Diversion. Yeah, uh, it's one of my favorite diversions. Uh, so I'm sorry, there was a hand up there in the. Yep. Yeah, we were talking a lot about infrastructure to support cars. I'm curious about the future of trains. Um, if we would ever see like a high speed rail in the future, sort of 30 year projection. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Absolutely no. I mean, uh, you're talking about technology that's, uh, you know, some people goof because the Japanese technology has been in place for 40 years or so at this point. So, um, so there is hope. Uh, I think back in the hope and aspirations was uh, funding in the form of the recovery dollars. Um, and so as we speak, they're turning over dirt and, and building this stuff in in, uh, in uh, California. Um, but then on the safety side too, there's things that will increase safety on rail. Uh, positive train control was kind of a buzz term that was used at the beginning, beginning of the summer. Uh, there was the crash in Philadelphia. Um, and this is technology that will also in its own way talk to uh, the operations of the train to get it slowing around and twisting curves and whatnot. So I, I do see it holding a lot of promise. Quick, quick factoid on high-speed rail, my staff just Doug, this up yet? I can give you a number on high speed rail. So um, it would cost $500 billion to put 80% of the U.S. population within a reasonable mileage distance of high speed rail. So $500 billion, a lot of money, um, but we've seen in our recent lifetimes here far vaster sums of money spent on uh, other enterprises. Are you saying billion with a B? Yes. Yeah. B. Million. They, just, they just use B's and now T's for trillions. Yeah, if it were 500 million, I mean, we would have done, yeah, we could do a Kickstarter yeah. or something. <laughs> I, no, I have two questions, though. I, and I'm, well, I, there's a lot more audience questions, but I mean, on rail, because it is something I wanted to ask about. So uh, there's a piece of this that we talked a little bit about it being a, a socially accepted project. I have rarely seen, other than maybe education policy, something that at one time was something a lot of people agreed on that has suddenly become, and not suddenly, but, but relatively recently become so divisive. And you have people of different political persuasions run almost single issue candidacies against uh, something like a rail line or a streetcar or whatever it is. Um, and I, that's interesting to me. It's, uh, it does seem like a shift. And so when you say you're hopeful about it, I guess I'm trying to figure out, A, how, where that in antipathy towards this comment, I mean, I guess I'm pushing a little bit to say, how realistic is it really when you have a big segment of the political class, at least, who says, you know, over my dead body, I will literally turn down, like, money, even if you build this for me, I will stand in front of the train. So we've seen that before in the past where these political stances uh, turning away money in places like Florida, in places like Wisconsin and Ohio for high-speed rail. Um, so, you know, a new governor comes in and that's just part of his platform. But I think, I really believe and think that there is a tipping point, um, sort of a fatigue factor that comes into play where, um, you know, and I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that you know, some people feel like we can't just go two months or even six months. Uh, the reality of big infrastructure projects is it takes years to do these things. So when you say, yeah, we're gonna fund for four months or six months, in infrastructure speak, that's like the day after tomorrow when it comes to building these things. Um, and just a, another aspect of this, not just rail, and, and rail is, is really important in terms of freight movement in this country, it is, a, it is of huge importance. I think the passenger side is still coming along. You know, if we can just get our regular rail system to perform a little better, I guess you know, I'd be happy about that. <clears throat> but there's also an inland waterway system in this country we have barges that are moving massive amounts of raw materials. A lot of that you know, goes into export markets, which is good for this country. So there's really, if you think about it, three parts to the surface transportation system in this country that moves freight and people. And that's you know, the, the highway system itself, cars and trucks, you know, for, for better or for worse. You know, that is the way it is in terms of how our culture has developed. And then there's also the rail system and the inland waterway system. Again, it's kind of a three-legged stool and all parts of that system really have to be working well. And the inland waterway system got one of the worst grades on the port card, a D minus. I mean, it's barely, I mean, people, the Corps of Engineers are saying, you know, you really don't think it's an F? Um, you know, parts of that system, the locks, more than half the locks on that system are past their design life. Mm -hmm. No, the locks. 
Um, <laughs> I, uh, Concrete and steel. Yeah, I, I guess. I, I'm aware of a lot. Uh, <laughs> for a you. Um, yeah, one, and you brought this up then about the, the moving uh, tr uh, goods, and particularly where we, our part of the country, in the Midwest, we see tons of oil moving, right? We actually did a show just recently in North Dakota, and uh, you could time your watch by how often the oil trains come by. It's about every five times an hour, it seems like. Uh, and that seems to me to be one of the things that we don't talk about a lot. I have a lot of friends who love rail and think, oh, we absolutely should have a rail. And they almost, uh, out of a sense of duty, say, I'm going to take a train to Chicago or to Fargo or something like that. And then the oil trains come through and they get priority. And so then the, the passenger trains end up sitting for literally hours uh, on that. And so uh, I guess it, these are competing systems right now. And I guess the question is, how do you well, do you move the, past the, that? Well, the freight company, I mean, Vin, you may know better than I, but the, the, the freight companies, I mean, the railroads own much of the rail system. Right. And Amtrak only owns a little bit of, of the rail system in the United States. So passenger rail has to make deals and, if you will, buy, you know, buy permission to use you know, the, the freight rail system. You mentioned the, the, oil, the oil tankers. I mean, this is a safety issue. I know the Department of Transportation is focused a lot on the safety of the, of the rail cars that are carrying all this oil. And again, this has been, a, you know, this is a good thing for the United States. The notion that the U.S. could actually consider exporting energy out of this country when, you know, a lot of us grew up in the, you know, in the 70s when it looked like we were going to run out of energy uh, in the year 2000. So, um, you know, it's really a game changer, the energy profile of the United States now. But it does create safety issues in the rail sector. It's going to be carrying all that oil. So does, if you're projecting out a new rail, a high-speed rail system, is that all new track that it would need to be, I presume? Uh, no, not all new track. Um, some of it is shared use. Uh, some of it, uh, large parts of it, will be will need to be enhanced uh, to accommodate higher speeds. Um, but in places like California, it's it's a real lift to do that out there because part of the process is purchasing parcels of land, um, doing what is the environmental process, uh, which can sometimes take years. Um, uh, Casey had mentioned how uh, five hundred billion dollars would fully integrate to one high-speed rail system in the United States. You know how much we've invested. Um, oh, we should guess. Uh, I'll give you, go ahead. Do you guys want to guess? <laughs> um, 100 billion. 101 billion. <laughs> <laughs> a dollar. <laughs> uh, Price is right, the dollar gets it. Uh, <laughs> 8 billion dollars. 8 billion. Is what our last recovery funded for that. So, 500. I wish it were 100 and a 401. <laughs> uh, okay, I, I took a lot of time there, but I want to get some more audience questions right there. Um, hopefully, this isn't going too far into sci fi territory, but if we're looking you know, 30, 40 years out, it seems like self driving cars would be some degree of self driving controls in cars or might be part of the future. What impact do you think that will have on, I guess, infrastructure planning, like getting the trains and other alternatives? and on the labor market surrounding transit in the U.S.? Um, well, I think it's a good thing. We're, we're kind of bullish on innovation. Uh, and I think integration is one of the, the big pieces to this, but also safety. Um, so when you have different modes of transportation trying to kind of compete or integrate together, you have to, you have to worry about safety. On the workforce side, I think it's a, it's a little bit like kind of that, that balloon that we push it on one side, it kind of comes out the other side. It's, it's this, you know, we have one of the biggest retiring workforces in transportation, um, highest percentage over the age of 40. Uh, that will need to be, you know, either retire or will need to train up again. Uh, but when you do train up again, you, you want to do it in these other fields, these emerging markets. When you say the transportation field uh, is, it, what, what, what all does that entail? What, what? Transportation workforce, it yeah. can be everything from air traffic controllers to bus operators to what are becoming more computer science oriented jobs to programming uh, uh, operations in vehicles. Uh, we talked about high speed rail, we talked about data, the uses of big data to. And everyone who's doing that is octogenarian. <laughs> okay. Uh, to, to, to your question, though, I think I think those technologies will make existing systems more efficient because I think about, and then you truly able, will be able to text and drive. Oh, uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. Secretary of the Hood's campaign on uh, 
distracted driving. Yeah. For instance, uh, platooning and trucking. It's the concept that trucks can automate and literally drive 60, 70 miles with this much space between one another. Uh, that's the type of efficiencies that we're talking about. Um, and if you've ever seen a demo on the autonomous vehicle that, that Google puts out there, um, they've done some in this area. And it's amazing what you see on the graphics in front of you. You see all these other boxes of cars that are kind of drifting into lanes, drifting ahead, going faster. And yours is, is monitoring all of that around you so it stays within this one sphere. But it's amazing when you see these are all humans and they're all kind of going like this. And this is the autonomous car kind of going like that. If you're having like a platoon of 60 trucks, um, I'm envisioning my head, uh, what's the point of freight trains at that point? What's the uh, point of investing in the freight trains? I didn't say 60. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Those, those systems work together a lot. Um, you know, uh, like the barges can handle massive amounts of raw materials. Um, the, uh, the trains can carry pretty big loads, but they will often get to a point where you're literally, you know, taking, um, you know, something right off of the train and putting it onto, you know, the, the, the flatbed of a truck, and it, it does kind of the final drive to the final, the final destination. So these systems actually work together. And back to your question, your, the point you were making about technology. If you look at the, here's another deadline Congress has on the FAA reauthorization. I think it's September 30th. Um, they're trying to build out the next generation air traffic control system, and what that system will allow is the planes to fly more efficiently, use less fuel, fly closer together when they're on their approaches into yeah. airports. So, <laughs> yeah. Again, uh, you know, these are, no, it's important, important system. And it's going to take years to build out. It will cost tens of billions of dollars, but we'll be, we'll be better off for it in the end. Okay, uh, there was a hand right here. Great. Uh, so actually on that, you know, is one system more obsolete than the other? I, I've got a question. So let's really briefly abridge the history of transportation. Please, very briefly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we built a bunch of White Houses in the 1790s. We subsidized a bunch of canals in the 19th century. We give the railway land grants out. Then we uh, signed the road acts in the early teens and built a ton of highways, spending a ton of money. And then, of course, by the time the 50s rolled around, the Eisenhower Act exponentially increases the role of highways. And we also built a lot of airports starting World War II. We really seem to pick a lot of winners and losers in this kind of history. And we really never holistically look at how the system works. Like you go back 100 years and you look at how a road functions. And you see people working with food carts, working with street cars, working with automobiles. And all of these modes are crossing all over each other in kind of an organic system. Up until, say, some of the competitive grants of Tiger, where you see grants going for different nodes based on properties where they really do a cost-benefit analysis, policy in this country seems extremely prescriptive towards one mode or another, choosing winners and losers, and never holistically looking at the problem. Would you, would you agree with the statement that there was well, never well, that's been, always a question. Would you agree with the statement that there has never really been a comprehensive tra pol transportation policy in this country, because it seems to me that we never really had transportation policy looking at the entire field in the modern age. We could have been more holistic. I agree with that, yeah. for sure. Absolutely. Um, but you know what? With the winners and losers are picked for better or for worse. Um, we still have a $16 trillion economy in this country, and a lot of that is because of the infrastructure that we, and you, you laid it out, the canals and you didn't mention the Clean Water Act and all the, you know, water pollution control technology that was put in, and just modern drinking water systems that were put in at the beginning of the 1900s in this country did more to extend life expectancy in the United States than any vaccine or any medical innovation. So, you know, we take all this for granted, but I think in terms of our longevity, in terms of life here, and just the, the size of the economy, um, maybe some better bets could have been placed, but the bets that were placed weren't that bad. And I, I, I'll just add that I think that it's very much a uh, user-driven uh, system. So you know, when you had the uh, intercontinental rail, uh, the Golden Spike, everybody wanted to take rail to go see the other side of the country. Um, when Eisenhower's highway system was conceived, uh, everybody wanted to take Route 66 to go see California. Um, so I think what you're seeing though now is more of an integrated system. Um, tends to happen more in the urban setting. Uh, bike lanes, right? Uh, you're seeing transit, uh, bikes that you can put on your bus and then take that to the next location. Um, so it's all about choice, I think, at the end of the day. That's so, but to follow up on this, there is a piece that I wanted to ask you in the terms of, uh, in both your cases, being uh, sort of 
Responsive versus prescriptive. And I, uh, I totally understand and I, I'm always interested in folks in both cases because you know I'm sure that you both see, oh, the ways people are using uh, transportation or infrastructure or even technology is changing in ways that we didn't predict. And yet, I also have to imagine that there are ways that maybe you do want to, sort of, even if we're talking about climate change, we probably do want to sort of try and incentivize people to make choices that are different. So, how much of your jobs are prescriptive versus just responding to the things that are happening? Well, prescriptive, if, if we can do that though, I think we're better off in a performance-based approach. In other words, you describe the outcome that you want to see without prescribing necessarily all the modes that are going to be used or, or even the technologies. You could just say, we want cities to have acceptable mobility. You, just, you define what that is, whether 50 miles an hour during rush hour on a highway, or metro doesn't break down you know, every five, I mean, met, look at our metro system in this region. I mean, it's unbelievable what's happened to it. And you know, my whole time here, it's gone from this gleaming new system to one that, frankly, I try to avoid at times, just because I seem, every time I get near it, I'm offloading at West Falls Church. <laughs> West Falls Church. We get it. I get it. Uh, <laughs> I get it. It's a town. Say, say the right thing. Yeah, I would say that my, my job is a lot more of, uh, I, I don't want to use the term prescriptive, but I guess that's the way I would go is, you know, when you're thinking about policy, you're thinking about outcomes, you're thinking about performance. Um, and so you, you do have to take this more holistic view. Sure. Uh, Sure, we, at the end of the day, we do need to kind of push the formula dollars out there. Uh, that's what's going to keep the system that we have in place uh, up to snuff. But, um, but I'd say mine is a lot, maybe it's, maybe it's more of a 50-50, but I think it's a lot more prescriptive. And we have to be a lot, a lot more forward-leaning, at least, mm -hmm. in, in con conceiving the solutions and implementing them. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to be so prescriptive as a society that we're inhibiting new technologies, new thinking, new approaches. So I, I really, I, I find the performance-based approach. Okay, yes, this will probably be the last one we get to. My, my question, I wanted to build off something the moderator was saying about some of the uh, governors turning down money and so forth. Uh, we've seen, you, you talked about how in cities there's a desire for all these different types of transportation, bicycling, transit, to coexist, and then in rural areas, mostly only the driving, and that means there's a large contingent of voters who say, I don't want any money spent on bicycle infrastructure or, the, or any money spent on transit. And as a result, states, which the money goes to, a lot of them spend a fair amount of their time being either totally hostile to kind of the things that cities want. We saw that most recently in Maryland, where the governor took all the money from Baltimore for everything Baltimore wanted and just gave it to the rural areas. Is there anything that the uh, Department of Transportation is doing to help make sure that the urban areas don't sort of get completely ignored by their state governments, you know, approximately half the time? Um, well, you know, we, we don't, in terms of elections, because that's a little bit we're touching on right now, um, and, and that's not for us to decide. Like, we, we, we do what we can with the tools that we have. Um, one of the biggest tools that we have involves our regulatory system process. So when, a, when Congress says you guys need to make a rule, it needs to meet A, B, and C, and then everything in kind of in between we get to tweak and interpret and push out there. I think that's where we feel like we can make the greatest gains to change that proposition that you've described. Um, but you, you're also very accurate in talking about you know, when, when a governor wins uh, to the victory or the spoils, and that's just kind of how it works in a formula-based system when you're putting putting those ones out there. I, I think people need to remind themselves that we're the United States of America, we're not the 50 states of America. Um, you know, in red state America, um, you know, the, the breadbasket to the world, that stuff has to end up on a barge or on a train or on a truck. So it is, even though it's in the hinterlands, it is tied in infrastructure systems hey, hey, that, hey, that tie into cities. <laughs> They tie into the cities, and at the same time, I think the cities have to be a little concerned about rural America too and their infrastructure challenges, which could be the condition of the dam. You know, there's, there's over 70,000 dams in this country. 5,000 of them are high hazard dams, meaning if something goes wrong, um, we have dead people. Okay. Um, there, are, there are levees. We don't even know how many miles of levees. The Congress just passed a, a 
sa uh, levy safety law. The first thing they have to do is come with the inventory. We don't even know if we think 100,000, 150,000 miles of levy. It's not even sure. Um, so um, different parts of the country have different infrastructure challenges, and I think the country needs to unify and not separate on these issues. Uh, so last question, and it's only because we did, this is the one kind of, it's not a technology or, or mode that we didn't really get to, which is uh, just walking around, right? Like uh, just uh, moving around in the terms of, uh, we've obviously been walking a lot while we've been here, and we walk a lot at home, and um, I, I, I guess the question is simply, we talk about all these new technologies, and as we even started with, there's all this emphasis on wanting to build something new. I guess. Uh, Actually, how we get to even the types of transportation we use is a really important question as far as uh, what our infrastructure in cities look like and, and the ways that we then use those. Uh, I guess, uh, as a kind of closing question, how do you both think about that, the stuff that happens outside of a car or a train or a barge, if that's making it to work? <laughs> um, you know, bike, bike lanes are, you know, it's part of the transportation legislation. You know, communities can you know, use some of those funds for, for bike lanes, for you know, pedestrian access, for, um, for facilities that have many uses. There could be a, a transportation connection, but the facility could also have kind of cultural and other meanings for a community. So you know, communities have to you know, have the ability to kind of you know, call their own shots on some of this stuff. I mean, you know, places are different, and I think that's why people like you know, traveling around this country, because so many different places to see. So people are gonna handle the challenge differently. Some parts of the country will be more into biking and moving around on foot than, uh, than other parts of the country. Yeah, and I think it's obvious, but um, when you kind of see it, taste it, touch it, um, that's a real game changer. Uh, so, you know, those of us who have tried to get our parents to understand, much less get into an Uber or a Lyft, <laughs> Right? It's like the first time that they do that, it's like, this is sliced bread, this is an innovation, this is incredible. What is Uber? <laughs> okay, <laughs> a tremendous round of applause. Uh, we're going to do the stage over one last time to the cast and the theater public policy, just like before. This is all made up, all improvised, so please, a round of applause for teaching. Good. It's time we had our other talk. Oh, I'm going to be graded again. I know it. I wanted you to know that to discuss our relationship, I decided to use a new metaphor because your grade from our love bridge improved. Oh, am I a C now? You are a high hazard dam. <laughs> my love is barely contained for you, Carl. It's pressing against my walls at all times. But if it fails, <laughs> In this metaphor, that's a good thing. <laughs> so you are my third plane, right? And I am. Oh, I, I, I make the metaphor. Doctor, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm confused. I feel sick, and you're asking me to just go home and let it happen. I, I, can, can I get a prescription for any drugs? You just want to react. <laughs> to whatever happens. I have appendicitis. I, I self-diagnosed. I love MD. <laughs> slow, slow down. You're getting a little excited. You're saying some words that I don't necessarily recognize. Wow. Uh, I think that we should just wait until the big oops happens. That's what I'm calling it. What is the big oops in the world of appendicitis? By you'll, chance? You'll know it when you're going, oh, oh, and you're making those noises. And then we'll just react at that point. Yeah, and then we'll do the surgery. Because, I mean, whoa, <laughs> writing out all those forms for medicine, that's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> all right, whippersnappers, I am the oldest air traffic controller you ever seen. <laughs> so, watch! <laughs> Just try to land. Man will never fly. <laughs> what are you talking about? Eight people in one airplane? Bullshit! I, I, I can do this from home. I can telecommute. I can do all the control on my phone. That's not a phone! That's a... I just landed a plane in Baltimore. <laughs> but they were going to Vegas! <laughs> okay. <laughs> I fixed it. They're going back. Don't worry. Oh, you think you can get me out of here? That ain't gonna happen! We do have a mandatory retirement age. I was a kitty hawk! <laughs> we got you this cake. You're leaving today. It's in the shape of 
The Wright Brothers' plane. <laughs> I rode in that plane! <laughs> Didn't go nowhere. Went up a little bluff and then boom, right down into the South Carolina dunes. Why do you work at an air traffic controller if you were on a plane that didn't go anywhere? Cause I gotta overcome my fear. <laughs> Talk more about that. It's a psychological principle. Cause if you have exposure and response prevention, you get better. But if you're always running, you're never gonna go nowhere. I got up here by train, but I'm leaving this place in a coffin on a plane. Your coffin's arrived. <laughs> I'm so glad that we live together and we're boyfriend and girlfriend. This yeah, is coming out so great, baby. Well, oh, it's a little fast. It's a little fast. Well, speaking of fast, did I tell you, my grandparents said they were going to come visit all the way from Chicago and they were going to take a train. Uh, Don't worry. It's, you know, we have plenty of time to hide the fact that we're cohabitating three marathons. It's a six hour. Here we are. They got that high speed train. Oh, <laughs> Other. There's only one bed! <laughs> it, it, has a, it has a dam in the middle and it's a hazard proof I was going to set up the futon and make it look like you and I slept in separate rooms. I didn't think that Hurry, I was distracted with the Uber app. Look at this. There's a car a block from here. I went to the lift. How do you think I got the paper on stilts. <laughs> That's excellent. There will be other things to discourage transportation. For example, I am incentivizing the destruction of theater, after school programs and intramurals. There will be no sports and we are giving subsidized cutbacks for introverts to move into the city so they'll never leave the house. and formed an opinion. That's who I am. <laughs> Shut-ins love you. That you're their number one candidate. Thank you. They call me the Hermit King. <laughs> there will be no need to replace infrastructure if we keep everyone in the house. We will make it mandated that no women will be attracted because we found on our data that that's why a lot of guys go out to bars for the chicks. There will be nothing but crones in this city. I agree. I've done a policy paper. You have to use your actual Photograph on social dating sites. Nicely done! <laughs> Nicely done! I think uh, the bikes are going in their bike lane. Little nails pop up and pop up. Yes! <laughs> yes! Well done! Well done! I have a policy paper here on unicycles. No one can really ride them unless you're a clown. <laughs> the only hesitation I have with that is that clowns sound like fun. Oh. <laughs> that might incentivize people to leave the house. Every time a person leaves the house, we have to think in 30 years, we might have to replace the sidewalk they walked upon. And if there are clowns, that's like times 30. So we're, we're thinking about money in the hundreds with an H. We will replace the gas tax on blockers. Unpack that. <laughs> now tell me a little bit more about yourself. I saw you on, uh, on, on, you know, 
Kinder, I think. And uh, I just I, I wasn't sure what your interests were. Well, um, oh, this, this seems weird, but I'm really into trains. Is that right? Yeah. Like a human train? Like, is that a little like... <laughs> some way to kind of make a more holistic approach to passenger trains and freight trains by making these convoys of trucks that actually move in sequence. And I know it's... Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Here, finish my nachos. Yeah. Rumi, how did the date go? You know, he was fine. He just was this policy walk. He yeah. just was spitting words at me. He was holistic, not about like the Trader Joe's Whole Foods version, but it's about like a policy. Did, did you I didn't feel much. It, it was it was kind of a you know he magnets were talked about. Well, there was no magnet between us. I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah. I mean, I can set you with my other friend next week. He's really into um, making college affordable for everybody. That's what I'm <laughs> Congresswoman. Yes. I have made a horrible mistake. I know that you are representing Nevada, and I have an inland waterway course through the state that um, I have seen funded and now we're in trouble because we don't have water. <laughs> Put the horse's head here. <laughs> I wasn't sure if that's necessary. It is not then. Hey, is there something on your chin? You no. Stop it. It is a bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since they put in that highway, I, I, I I'm confused. I'm miles out of my range. I'm drawn towards him. Birds, this way! Birds, just follow the migratory path! Is there a point to anything that we do? I don't know. Don't be created by God. Ready up! Ready up! Don't be distracted by this technology! Continue yourself! Put up your own mortality, make the free will choice. I think I really impressed him. Good. <laughs> yeah, oh god, he was hot. Just a little side thing. Yeah. No, 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 it's fine. We got open business in the first part of the meeting. So I have a I have a question. I got approached by a sing-songy man in a top hat about a monorail. <laughs> Talked about a, a certain number of trombones and a way to change a town. I was very confused. That sounds like a great idea. Well, it sounded fine until we started talking about the way it broke our town apart. Really? Yes. <laughs> right down went a little something like this. <laughs> There's a rail, then there's some people, then your town just falls apart. First there's a town, then there's a city, but it's all just a little beep. First word, there's a place to be, it's not for you or me. It's called mass transit. It's not a monorail, but it's similar if you look in third vision. It's mass transit. I'm thinking. 
Michigan that I see strip malls and soulless communities behind walls and kids who've never seen a store outside of the downtown and have do drugs because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> Gentrification! <laughs> Is this really what people desire? We'll accept by our life street cards. That was bad to run. <laughs> but at least it was in rhythm, sir. <laughs> what shall we do? I think we should integrate, take the various systems, and make them copulate. <laughs> Find out if those systems are great by using performance measurements. It's a way, a metric really, of judging how things work, both present and future, based on upward mobility. It's fine. I learned about it at a public policy themed improv show. <laughs> Come on. That's when I decided to write a Broadway musical about the product of love of my mother. 